Welcome back to another Little Days lesson in pre-calculus. Uh, I'm going to talk about several things in this video because this particular unit has just a, a mishmash of three different things. Um, they're all vaguely related, I suppose, in that I guess they're all math. Here we go. The first one I want to talk about is continuity and therefore discontinuities and a three-step test for continuity. The next one I want to talk about is the intermediate value theorem. And then finally, really briefly, um, end behavior. So, continuity. I have a graph on the board right here. It's an odd graph. Finding the equation of that would be lovely. That, that, that would be a piecewise function for sure. Um, but it has three things on it that I'm going to use as my examples of the continuities we're going to be talking about or we're going to be finding. Uh, there are others, but these are the three main ones we're going to deal with. So the first one is this asymptote. Actually, I should tell you what continuity is. Do you remember continuity from, say, I don't know where you saw it last, grade school math, middle school math? The very, very basic idea is if I can take my little finger and start way out on the left of the function and trace along the function without ever picking my finger up, then the function is continuous. But if I have to pick my finger up, it's not continuous anymore. So as I work from left to right, this one is going to go up and up and up forever. I'll never get over there. So I'm going to have to pick it up at some point and start over here. Although that might be impossible because <laughs> up there is forever. And then I'd have to start it forever. Even worse. So this is called a discontinuity. And it's wherever you see a vertical asymptote. It's called an infinite. And finite discontinuity. Discontinuity, see if I can spell today. So there's the first one, an infinite discontinuity right there at x equals negative 1. At x equals negative 1. Uh, the next one we run into is, here I am tracing along with my little finger, and oh, the whole graph just switches y values. That's called a jump discontinuity. Jump. Jump discontinuity at x equals 1 in this case. Okay, so I've made my jump and I put my finger back down and I trace along and oh, there's this, there's this, oh, that's called a hole. Um, a hole. As you know, that's where you have a rational function and you can divide out a root from the numerator and the denominator. Uh, that, that's a hole. That's an infinity. Um, also called a point discontinuity. Actually, they all have various names, but these are the names I'm going to go with right now. Uh, also called a removable. Has that got an E in it? I don't think so. It doesn't anymore. That's supposed to be an L. L. Removable discontinuity. Um, I'll probably use removable most myself, because if you remember what I just said, if I had, say, y equals x minus 3, that quantity divided by the quantity of x minus 3, you could divide out the x minus 3s, can't you? That's called removing the discontinuity, but when you graph it, you better make sure to put a little hole there at x equals 3. Okay, and this is at, where is this? x equals 2. 2. So those are the three main discontinuities uh, you're going to have to recognize in a graph. And it's easy to do in a graph. They, that's what they look like. Might be, uh, might be a little more difficult when you're graphing, but you've done all that sort of graphing before. Okay. It's an entirely different matter when you need to do this uh, in algebra. So here's a problem. Is f of x equals, what do I want? How about 3x minus 1 over 2x minus 6 continuous at x equals 3? There we go. Uh, so there's a little bit of algebra. There's a nice rational expression. And I'm asking the question, is it continuous? Well, when you get asked these things in this sort of form here, where there's some algebra to be done, you don't have a graph, then you need to do what is called the three-step test for continuity. And you're going to need to do all three steps, even 
if the function fails the first or second step. You still need to show me all three steps. So that's what I'm going to do. This method is going to be called the three step test for continuity at a point because we're only doing this at x equals three. So the three step test for continuity at a point. Step number one, number one, little point there. Uh, does the function exist? f of x, whoops, not f of x. Does the function exist at the point you're trying to investigate? Is there an f of three? And that's a simple thing to find out. I just plug it in and I get nine minus one over six minus six, which is eight over zero. Ah, this is undefined. No. And as you've known, because you've been graphing these for years, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have a vertical asymptote, a discontinuity, as you've seen in the picture before this. All right, so it failed the first step. Uh, I'm going to go on to the second step. The second step is, is there a limit as x approaches the point I'm talking about of the function? Is there a limit of this function as x approaches 3? Well, let's find out. x approaches 3. They already know through this first step that if I just did direct substitution, I get 8 over 0. And that, that, that's not helpful. But what if I tried uh, 3x minus 1 over 2x minus 3? Did that help? No, that didn't help either. Hmm. So this is also going to give me something that is not an answer, something that is undefined. And for the case of the three-step test for continuity, I really don't care if this is going to positive infinity or negative infinity, meaning both sides of the uh, curve are going up to positive infinity or down to negative infinity as you approach x equals 3. Don't really care. All I need to know is that it, it didn't work. It's undefined. So, undefined again. Wow, that's supposed to be an E. So, first step, does the function exist at the point you're trying to investigate? Second step, uh, does the limit exist as you approach that point? Third step, does f of 3 equal the limit as x goes to 3 of the function? Undefined cannot equal undefined. So the question is being asked, is this true? And the answer is, it's not true. Undefined does not equal undefined. Even if I wrote out infinity or infinity, infinity does not equal infinity. You can't have something that's undefined equaling something that's undefined. Okay, so those are my three steps for my three-step test for continuity. Now all I have to do is draw a conclusion, and I can say f of x is not continuous at x equals 3, period. So how would this conclusion change if it did? Uh, if both of these were, were some defined number and they were equal? Well, then all you have to do is take out the word not. So there's a quick example of the three-step test for continuity. Let's do another one. All right. So the one I have here, oh yes, uh, is f of x equals 6x minus 2. Oh no, that's not what I want to do. We're doing a piecewise function. 6x minus 2, 4x minus 4. And we want things, these things to come together at what? x equals negative 1. So x is negative 1. x is greater than or equal to negative 1. So is that at x equals negative 1? I forgot the word continuous. <laughs> uh, well, imagine I wrote the word continuous. Is that piecewise function continuous at x equals negative 1? Well, we have to do our three steps. Here come the three steps. Step number one, f of negative 1. Um, let's see. 
The second equation has the equal sign, so the second equation is the one I'm going to use to evaluate the function at negative 1. Please do not evaluate it at both. If you do that for the first step, if you have a piecewise function and you evaluate at both equations, that tells me you don't understand piecewise functions. Don't lose those silly points. Just use the one where the number actually applies, which in this case is the second, which means I'm getting negative 4 minus 4 equals negative 8. Simple enough so far. Here we go. The limit as x approaches, wait a minute, in this particular case, which equation do I use to do the limit? Both, because that's the definition of a limit. If you want a limit to exist at some x value, you have to approach from the right and from the left. If it exists, you approach the same y value. If it, they, each side approaches a different y value, it doesn't exist and you have a jump discontinuity. So I'm going to have to do this from the left side, which would be this top one, 6x minus 2, and I plug in a negative 1 and I get negative 8. Then I'm going to have to do it from the right side, which is the second equation, which I've actually already done because it's the same as that, negative 8. So the limit does exist. Yay! Step number 3. Um, actually, I should make a conclusion there, shouldn't I? Whee! Conclusion. Uh, limit as x goes to negative 1 of f of x equals negative 8. Step number 3. f of negative 1 does it equal the limit as x approaches negative 1 of the function? And the answer is yes, so I leave the little equal sign free. Now, at this point, many of you are going to probably write negative 8 equals negative 8. Please don't do that. I know negative 8 equals negative 8. You don't have to tell me that. What I'm trying to ask you, what the three-step test is telling you to tell me, is that the function you found in your first step is equal to the limit you found in your second step. Function equals limit. Don't tell me some number equals another number. Don't care. Don't want to know. Not what I'm asking you. Not what the function. Not what the three-step test requires. All right, I did leave myself much space, but here we go. F of x is continuous. Wow. Squeeze it over R2's head here. Is continuous at x equals negative one. So there's another quick example. In this particular case, I had to take a limit from both sides because it's a piecewise function. In the first case, I did not, but that's simply because it's not a piecewise function. All right. Do. Oh my, I'm gonna have to really deep clean this board soon. So that's the three-step test for continuity. Ah, yes, right, here we go, intermediate value theorem. This is one that kind of seems like a bit of mathematical common sense. Let me show you. So I'm just going to have a graph. doesn't really matter what the graph looks like. And it's going to go down here, and then I'm going to do that. So this is y equals f of x. And here is some point A and some point B, or some x value A and some x value B, which gives me these two points here, which means on the y-axis I will have an f of A, and on the x-axis I'll have an f of B. All right. So at the mean value theorem, mean value E, theorem is basically telling you is that if I have a function and it has to be continuous, a continuous function from A to B, then I am guaranteed that every y value between f of A and f of B exists. That's it. That's the theorem. It's as simple as that. So if I knew, for example, that this particular number was oh, 1, and I knew, for example, that particular number was 
7, and I know that this is a continuous function, then I know that between a and b, all the y values of 1 and 7 will exist. I will have some function in here that will give me 1 or something, or 1 or bigger, and something in here give me 7 or smaller. So for example, if I knew this one was something that I wanted, some c value, I'm absolutely guaranteed that it exists. Uh, that would be f of c, wouldn't it? If this were some f of c, I'm guaranteed that it exists, and it's going to exist at some x value between a and b. That, that point, there will be a point between a and b where all the y values from 1 to 7 exist. That's the mean value theorem in a nutshell, without writing down all the technical language. So how is it used? Well, it's used in a couple of different ways. Uh, the most obvious one is, is to find a y value between two given y, value, y values that you have, or, or you know. And one of the most obvious of those is where do zeros exist? So do I have an example of that written down here? Oh, yes, I do. So here I am. I'm going to give you f of x equals 3x cubed minus 2x squared plus 6x minus 1. Let's get rid of that to make it a little clearer. So I have that function, and I want to say, is there a 0 between uh, mm, x equals 0 and x equals 1? Just to make it very simple. Uh, this is going to require the mean value theorem. I don't want to have to find the actual zeros. I could with a calculator very quickly, and then I could just look at the calculator and see if it, you know, if the curve crosses the x-axis between 0 and 1. But suppose you don't have a calculator, which is, since everyone carries their phones around with them everywhere, impossible, but suppose it didn't happen. Uh, how would you do it? Well, the mean value theorem says, here's how you prove it. First, is the function continuous? Uh, specifically continuous between 0 and 1. And if so, you have to state that. You don't have to prove it, because that would be for, let's see, how many points are there between 0 and 1? An infinite number. I don't want to do the three-step test for an infinite number of points. So, all I need to know is, is this continuous between 0 and 1, and state it. That is a polynomial. Polynomials are always continuous over all x values. So it's got to be continuous. So f of x is continuous. Continuous. Let's see. For x is an element of 0 to 1. So I stated that it's continuous where it needs to be continuous. First step. Second step. This is going to be nice. Let's see. What is f of 0? Negative 1. What is f of 1? Oh, I don't know. 3 minus 2 is 1, plus 6 is 7, minus 1 is 6. So all I did was I substituted in the endpoints. I found the y values of the endpoints. And I immediately know that this function has to cross the x-axis between 0 and 1. How do I know that? Well, the y values changed sign. So what happened was it came from below the x-axis, where you have negative y values, to above the x-axis, where you have positive y values. It changed sign. Therefore, there must be at least one zero. Now, it could go back and forth and cross like 15 times. I don't know. But I know that it has to cross at least once because my y values changed sign. So, the... MVT, and yes, you're allowed to write MVT, it's fine, um, shows, or words to that effect, that f of x has a zero, whoops, uh, when x is an element of zero to one. Boom. So that's really probably the most 
common use you will see of this particular uh, mean value theorem or mean value theorem in this form. Um, this thing could have asked, or I could have asked you here, uh, not if there's a zero, but I could have asked you, does x equal five between zero and one? And your answer would be, yes, five is between the y values of negative one and six. Did I say x equals five? That was silly. Does y equal five? Does f of c equal five? Is there some x value where the y value is five? Yes, there has to be. There has to be every y value between negative one and six. And that's what the mean value theorem tells you. All right, there's your simple glimpse of the mean value theorem. Time to talk about n behavior. And n behavior is simple. We've actually already done the work for it in a previous section. But, so suppose I want to talk about n behavior. And behavior. And suppose I want to talk, do I give a nice example here or do I just go crazy? Uh, I do, look at this. Oh, that's kind of crazy. Suppose I want to talk about the function uh, 2x squared minus 3x plus 5 over 4x cubed minus 7x plus 1. There's a big old rational expression. I don't want to have to graph this rational expression. Looks complicated, looks difficult, and even whipping out your calculator is going to take a few seconds. So, what is the end behavior of this? What do I mean by end behavior? Yeah, here we go. Suppose I do have a set of axes, y and x. Uh, end behavior is what is happening to this function as I get way out there as x goes to infinity or x goes to negative infinity. So I need x going to negative infinity, whoops, or x going to infinity. That's end behavior. Is the y value getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, smaller and smaller and smaller, or getting closer and closer to some number? Can I answer that question by saying, well, the end behavior is, as x goes to infinity, y is going to positive infinity, y is going to negative infinity, or y is going to two. Here's how you find out. And here's where you go into stuff you already know how to do. Um, I'm going to say y equals the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x. That's it. That's all I'm going to do because that's what I want to know, isn't it? And since you've already done this sort of thing before, doesn't that tell you or doesn't that break down to this. Let's see, I've got a rational expression. If I use the uh, first term shortcut, then I'm going to have 2x squared over 4x cubed. What is the limit of that? And uh, let's come back here. Limit as x goes to infinity of uh, 1 over 2x. What's happening there? Well, that is going to zero. So what I know is the end behavior as x goes to infinity is zero. And what I've just found is a horizontal asymptote. This is actually the definition of a horizontal asymptote. End behavior is, can I discover a horizontal asymptote? And if so, what is it? And if I can't, is my answer positive infinity or negative infinity? Is y going to positive infinity? Is y going to negative infinity? So let's see. Um, I guess I have to do this in the negative direction also. The limit as x goes to negative infinity of y over 2x. Oh, guess what? That equals zero also. Nice? Nice. That's end behavior. And that's how I would justify my end behavior. And if I ever asked you to find, uh, well, let me write it down as a definition. If I asked you to find a horizontal asymptote, this is how you would do it. So this is basically the definition of a horizontal whoops, asymptote. Okay, definition.
definition of a horizontal asymptote, y equals the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x, or y equals the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x. Because there are two possible um, horizontal asymptotes, one going to the right or one to the left, or, or there might be one, or there might be zero, but there can never be three. So this is what you would do. This is how you would find in behavior you would use the definition of a horizontal asymptote. Or if I asked you to find a horizontal asymptote, you would write this down to prove that you have done the work to find the horizontal asymptote. And of course, the horizontal asymptote could be infinity or negative infinity. So there we go. The three-step test for continuity, the mean value theorem, and end behavior. That's all we needed to do today. Bye-bye.